All right, so EKS incident response and forensic analysis. Who here has worked with Kubernetes or EKS? Suspected very, very minimal people, right? Um, if you haven't personally, does your company use Kubernetes? Does your company use some sort of containerized system, right? So this has been happening for a lot of years, right? So it's not new. Um, and if you uh, know anything about the types of presentations like do, I like to research into the stuff that maybe we've kind of glossed over or hand waved over for a few years. And we're like, yeah, just, just do that, right? And I look at those those presentations and and um, I, I look at those um, you know blog posts or whatever and I'm like yeah but how right okay so I got it we're all using this stuff this is ubiquitous right this is kind of when the like when the cloud first came on and it was like well you know all that same stuff needs to happen and be done in the cloud um, and and we'll just figure it out it's like okay well let's figure it out let's do it let's put to their presentations let's see specifically prescriptively how do we do this right and so. EKS was really low on my list because I really did not want to try and attack it because it felt very overwhelming, right? It's this thing that's like so many people are using, we're using so many different containers, we're using so many different types of systems um, and uh, engineering teams are using this and they know all the jargon, right? And, and you sit down in a meeting with them and if you're in charge of defending or detecting or whatever and you sit down they're like, yeah, we're deploying this spec and pod with this workload and blah, blah, blah. And we're using, uh, you know, kubectl to, to orchestrate it and you're like, is there just like a log I can look at or something that we can do where I can skip past all this jargon, right? So the really the point of this is to, to kind of take you from zero to hero, right? And so a lot of things I like to do is I'd like to, to sit down and put into a singular format, something that's, that's just a, a singular takeaway where you can go, okay, I don't necessarily have to know a bunch about this. I can know a ton about it and I can know nothing about it. And no matter what, I should be able to walk away with something from this presentation that gives me tangible something that I can use right now, right? And so that's kind of the purpose behind this, right? And so I didn't have an about me slide about uh, for, for this presentation. It might be the first one that I haven't had uh, in a while. I think it's like the first time in four years that I uh, haven't, or I haven't presented in four years at a summit, so it's good to be back. But I've been doing this stuff for a while. I like to tackle the hard problems, and EKS was really low on my list, and I really didn't want to do it, and that's how I knew I really had to do it, right? And I was just like, let's just get this done. Let's have, like, one presentation that, like, gives us the 90% of stuff to do and get the searches and logs and what should we do. So that's kind of the background behind this, right? Uh, and so it's becoming increasingly popular. This is about EKS in particular, um, that, that is, a, is a managed form of Kubernetes in AWS, right? But Kubernetes or Docker or whatever underlying system, a lot of this is, is going to be the same or similar, right? So it doesn't necessarily matter that you have to be running this in AWS, right? But uh, a lot of these concepts are going to be the same. A lot of the stuff is going to be equally applicable, even if you run it in some other system or you run it on-prem, right? And so what I want to do with this is uh, there's a variety of blog posts out there or articles, right? It's like how to respond to EKS or containers or how many people have done a search for Docker forensics, right? Or Docker incident response or container incident response, right? And there's there's a lot of information out there, but at the same time, there's kind of not. Like I would, I would find myself reading each of them and going, okay, but what do I search for, right? It's like, okay, successful anonymous access, you know, and be like, well, Determine if an entity, you know, an unauthorized entity accessed your system. Okay. How, how though? Like, how do I go from that? Like, where do I look? What am I looking at? What are the artifacts, right? And so today, hopefully we'll go about changing this, right? So you have something to walk away with it. Hopefully fill in a lot of those gaps, right? And at least be a great starting point. And whether you know nothing about it or whether you know a ton about it, hopefully everyone learns something, right? So what kind of data and artifacts are we talking about? It? So um, under the hood, EKS, uh, leverages Docker uh, or Container D. Uh, all the latest versions of EKS in AWS use Container D. Doesn't mean you have to. You could configure it to use something differently. And I'm going to go through these terms and I'm going to give you data and artifacts. And a lot of this isn't going to make necessarily much sense to you, right? Because it's the it's these things like Overlay FS, right, and Verilive Docker Overlay and images and stuff like that. Don't worry about it. This thing is built so that even if it doesn't make sense now, it's introducing you to the concepts and the terms. And a week from now or a month from now or a year from now, when you're like, okay, we're really using this stuff. I really need to dig deep into it. What's like a singular source I can go to now that I understand these terminologies to make sense of this. And this will hopefully make a lot more sense than anything else that exists. And if it doesn't, please let me know. I want to know feedback and all this sort of stuff. What worked well, what doesn't, what made sense, like, let me know. So Docker 
itself uses OverlayFS. It's like a virtual file system and drivers uh, that allow you to run different containers and different stuff on a system, right? Shocker, right? Um, but this is just kind of a one-stop shop to show you it uses the system. This is where this stuff is located. And a lot of this will be Linux-based because this was a lot of my testing. And this is how a lot of the, these systems are run on Linux-based systems. You don't have to. These can run on Windows. They can run on Mac. I'm focusing on Linux. It's kind of the most ubiquitous set of the systems. Uh, and so uh, each of these containers uh, will be located under Ver Live Docker. So uh, probably an expected directory if you're familiar with Linux. Uh, and each container will have information about the image ID, mount points, and things like that under Ver Live Docker containers according to the container ID. And every container will have a configuration of its own. So your first step for looking at a container, if you're wondering what might be going on, is looking at the specifications. Where was it mounted? What is the image ID? These are all useful pieces of, of metadata of information that will help you in investigation. And then each image layer has its own directory under Verilive Docker Overlay or Overlay 2. Um, Overlay 2 is the latest development. It's for best performance. It's now the default latest. You don't necessarily have to use it, but both of those things exist. Overlay and Overlay 2 do the same thing. Overlay 2 is the latest for the best performance. Uh, images are stored by ID. So they're all gener they generate an ID and it'll be this long string of things that kind of look like a hash. And so um, each image will have that ID and under it will have different pieces of information. So that said, with this data and artifacts, this is kind of what we're looking at, right? So this is the ecosystem of where this will reside on a physical system. So it's when we when we think about containers, we think of very ephemeral stuff. We think of abstracted things. Uh, it's easy to get caught up, and I think this is why, like a lot of the information and blog posts, kind of highlight sit at the kind of high level. Um, but where is this stuff running? It's like when the cloud first came out, it's like, it's in the cloud. No, it's just someone else's computer, right? That was like a saying for a while, like containers are ephemeral and they're kind of like in this weird ephemeral, but like they're on a system and they're in these directories, right? So, so let's marry that. Let's like bridge that gap, right? So this is where they are on Linux, right? So hopefully it's giving some sense of like, okay, cool. If I'm familiar with Linux, even if I'm not, like it is running on a file system, on a system or a node, right? All of these 30, 100 different things on the system that's abstracted right like this is this is where the rubber meets the road right so here's where they are that was disk now there's memory like if we thought disk was complicated and something we didn't want to attack memory was another area right memory is often uh very difficult to um address in general it's a very complicated thing there is a reason that the art of memory forensics uh, is probably the largest book ever published on like a technical nature uh, relating to one singular thing, right? It's very, very complex. Um, and unfortunately, it's also a part of a detection and response for containers, right? But we don't need to be scared about it, right? If we understand how it, what it is and how it works, right? We can have kind of a more easy feeling understanding how do we, how do we address this, right? How should we collect it? How do we analyze it? How is it different, right? So each container runs as its own separate memory process, right? So let's get down in the weeds a little bit here. So on EKS, this means that each container will be a child process of a process called container D shim. So remember EKS uses container D instead of Docker as the runtime. There's, you can consider them interchangeable for this talk. It doesn't necessarily matter. Just know that whatever container uh, orchestration mechanism you're using, that will be the parent process. And then each container will have uh, processes running that are a child of those. So once you kind of understand that, right, it, it becomes a little bit less scary, right? So if you have 30 containers running on a system uh, or five containers or whatever it is, there will be five container shim process, parent processes with sub processes of whatever, whatever containers are running in that pod, right? So you can start to think visually of how this is gonna look, right? When you take a memory image, uh, full system, you can start thinking in your head, okay, I'm gonna look for the container shim processes. And then if there's seven of those, then I go, okay, there's seven containers on there in the system probably, right? You can start having deductive logic like this that makes it more palatable and be like, okay, this is kind of how I might go about looking at memory, which we'll get into later. So I put in here that it's best practice to collect memory from the entire system. Um, and I think this is a little bit of a debated topic. I'm saying it's the best practice from my experience and my testing and research. And the reason I'm saying that it's the best practice and we should default to this rather than could we go and collect memory from a singular process on a system or a singular container or pod on a system? Yes. Is that way more complicated than collecting it from the entire node or a uh, physical system that's running? Yes. So if it's way more complicated, there better be some additional value of this for me. And I haven't found it. It's way more complicated. And what if that container is, in, is not the only thing that's infected or affected on that system, 
right? We've got to do live response to go collect that memory. We're messing with the system. Maybe other stuff running out. Like I just, I don't see the value, right? So collect memory from the entire system because have you ever gone through an investigation and thought only one little thing was compromised and found out much more was, right? Kind of happens every once in a while, right? So let's start from a better perspective, right? Let's get it from the whole system and then we can look at everything else that's happening on the system to give us a better picture, right? So disk memory, and now we have logs. So there are essentially two sets of logs in the control plane here. Uh, one is the audit logs for EKS. And so these are everything that's listed there. I won't insult your intelligence and read it all. We will get into these a little bit more when I do a walkthrough as part three of this. We'll kind of walk through initial identification to collection to analysis of how we analyze these logs to figure out what's going on. Um, but that's the set of audit logs, which we'll be analyzing from the control plane. And then since again, we're talking AWS, there is control plane logs, which are cloud and cloud trail, right? And so these are available um, for actions performed at a higher level from an AWS infrastructure perspective. So like very large level, create the cluster, delete or manage an entire cluster, manage an infrastructure, deploy, like initiate EKS, right? Very high level stuff, very important, right? And it's gonna be a part of your process for investigation, right? So it's a very high level service control plane. And then you have these audit logs for EKS that will be most useful from a granular nature uh, for doing investigations, right? So there's logs produced by each pod uh, or container as well on each node. Uh, we'll get to those. Um, and uh, those are not in the control plane, right? Because they're running on a particular system. They're running in a particular container or pod, right? They're local to that. There's a couple ways to get to those, right? Which, which we'll get to. But we want to make sure all of these are available and enabled, right? So first step first, understanding what the logs are. Second is making sure they're all enabled because we're going to need to use them later on, right? So this is where we'll spend the bulk of our time for doing EKS incident response and investigation. And when I first started building this, um, I broke it out and I'm like, we're gonna do three scenarios. We're gonna do a Bitcoin miner because that's pretty prevalent and popular, but it's kind of like a gimme and I don't wanna just have that only one that's kind of like a so what. So I was like, let's do a successful anonymous access. Uh, let's do privilege escalation. And I started putting all this together. It got to be a super long presentation. And like, I was repeating like 90% of the slides and actions for like, each of these response processes for different scenarios. And so I'm like, well, the response process is largely the same. So it's gonna do one response process. This will vary slightly depending on whether it's a full node, whether it's a pod or container, right? But I'm covering both node and pod and container, right? Which is where a lot of these alerts will come from and kind of bubble up too, right? So I'm gonna address this from the, from the IR lifecycle perspective. So first from identification, to initial containment, how would you initially uh, identify the cluster or pod or node? Uh, how would you identify uh, how to contain each of those things singularly? And then how would you do the analysis for each of these things? So starting with guard duty, right? This is AWS after all. Uh, how would you identify uh, maybe something that's going wrong there, right? So here's an example of what is likely a Bitcoin miner alert. We have a private IP address, we got a public IP, we have the instance ID, and we have the cluster name. So these are all gonna be useful when you think, how would we track what's going on with this from our audit logging, right? We're gonna need several key pieces of information. And so really the IPs, the instance ID and the cluster info are gonna be your most useful information to really pivot and uh, search from a log analysis perspective. What about if it's a pod, if we have a pod, uh, privileged pod escalation, right? So this kind of alert will be useful. The most useful information will be what cluster was it in? What was the workload name? What was the namespace uh, and what was the container and image info, right? And so um, I am the world's worst attacker and I have named this very uh, conveniently for you to identify as privilege escalation pod, which will not happen uh, maybe in real life. Um, but, you know, just for demonstration purposes, right? If you're looking at guard duty and you're using that, this is how one alert might come through and how I might identify, okay, this is a pod specific thing, right? This is only a subset of a node or an instance. And what is that specific information that we need to use to pivot for it, right? So you can also do this uh, via, I've been told cube cuddle, C cube. I don't know if it's a long U, if it's a short U, someone could say it's cubby cattle. I don't care. I don't have skin in the game. Like I'll say whatever it is, but this is the tool for managing uh, uh, Kubernetes from the command line, right? 
Uh, and so we can also extract that information. Let's say it's not guard duty or we're doing some other deployment, like regardless of what's happening, uh, we can use this utility to get information we need. So remember I said, collect the IP, collect the, the uh, maybe the, the instance name, the node, like no matter what we have or don't, we can kind of pivot based on what we have. So uh, if we have an IP, we can get node information by just grepping for the private IP. Uh, we can get the instance ID if we just have a node name. So we may get an alert node, blah, 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 uh, is doing whatever. My next question in AWS is, okay, but what instance ID is that? Like, I have to know specific instance IDs to, to make corrective actions, right? And that's how you can get that there. Um, and then labeling, right? So this is this is an important part of the process. This is an important part of my standard incident response process of, of labeling or tagging, right? And there's 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 a variety of, of reasons for this. Um, and if you've seen my EC2 incident response and forensic analysis presentation, but the purpose of this is twofold. One is just a visual analysis for labeling. If someone comes across this, if someone's doing other queries, right? We know this is involved in something and it could be phase is quarantine. It could be status equals compromise. It could be, you know, job equals over, whatever you wanna put in there, right? Like this is just for you to label, right? For visual and two, this can be a mechanism for triggering automations for response, right? Uh, especially if we're talking automations in AWS atmosphere and infrastructure, uh, we can have uh, lambdas and response processes and workflows that go, once something is labeled this, go and immediately triage and collect and blah, blah, blah. And this is a great mechanism to do it for uh, a node. What about for a pod? What if it's a privilege escalation pod, right? If it's something specific to a pod? Well, so if we're thinking larger perspective where I said we want disk and memory, those are important, right? We're gonna wanna collect those as a standard part of our response. Um, if we have a pod, we've got to work our way back up, right? If I pod, then I need another node. And once I know the node, I need another instance ID, right? So identify a node associated with a pod, give it the pod name, you'll get the node. Then you go identify the instance ID of the node where it's running. And then in this instance, uh, we'll label the pod. So we don't necessarily know that the node itself is compromised, but maybe the pod or container is compromised, right? And so we can apply a label specifically to a pod, right? And we can apply it specifically to a node. So there's two ways of doing that. So data acquisition, and this is like a verbatim slide from the EC2 incident response, because this is not gonna be different. It's an AWS, a node is an instance, you're gonna collect an instance, an instance is an instance, right? So nothing is necessarily different here, right? So we want to, uh, first things first, we want to make sure that we prevent the uh, attacker from purposefully deleting data or us accidentally terminating an instance or something like that. So we enable termination protection. We want to make sure that thing does not go away until we're done with it. We want to make sure the instant shutdown behavior is set to stop because it could be set to terminate. So if we go through this and we set it to stop and say, oh, get that out of production and it's set to terminate when it shuts down, that's bad news bears, right? That's not coming back. Uh, tag it, identify volumes attached to the instance. Disable the delete on termination for each volume, right? Because maybe the volumes are set to delete on termination. So even if we have the, the instance set to not terminate, uh, if we shut it down or, or um, uh, uh, yeah, shut down the instance, then we don't want those volumes going away either because we want to collect those, right? So we acquire snapshots of each volume and we acquire memory for the instance with your choice or method, um, which we can get into uh, in a little bit. So disk, memory, and logs. So ideally, these logs already exist. When you go and you stand up EKS, it gives you an option and says, would you like to collect these logs? Please say yes. Then we'll go to CloudWatch. This is the entire basis for this presentation. If you don't do that, this will not help you. I'm sorry. So please do that, right? So ideally those already exist somewhere, right? So we've said what they are. You can go through, for some reason you get check boxes to, to select which ones you wanna collect and not. I, I collect them all um, unless you're feeling super, super confident and lucky and say, I never ever want this type of log. Uh, that's up to you. Uh, but ideally they're all enabled, right? Um, those are the cloud control plane logs, right? You enable CloudTrail, you enable the audit logs. What about the pod logs? Well, those are resident on the system unless the attacker has deleted those, but those are important to us, right? Um, you could fetch the logs from an active pod or container by using uh, the kubectl command to, to access the logs for those. We're collecting disk. Those logs are gonna be on disk. Arguably, I don't know if you would want to collect them actively, like you're gonna start instantiating commands, you're gonna be doing API calls against the affected server. That's gonna mix in with the attacker logs. I don't know if you wanna do that, that's up to you. 
they should be resident on disk, right? So you shouldn't have to do this. If you need to or want to, these are the commands to do it. You can also get them from a previously running pod. If that pod was deleted, right, we're not gonna collect the disk with that pod. So this is probably where it's more useful to know this command to collect logs from a previously running pod. So keep that in mind, right? So if you go in and say, well, we collected a disk, we collected memory uh, from this pod. Uh, and then after the fact, after the system shut down, you go, it was a previously running pod. It was probably important to realize that and issue a command like this to extract those at least from from uh, the, the the logs that are still resident in memory on the system. So we've identified what it is, a node or a pod, identified how to collect all that initial information, right? It's doing bad stuff possibly, right? So let's contain it. How do we effectively contain this initially for a response, right? We don't wanna leave it running for four days while we figure this out, right? So we can cordon an entire node, they call it cordon, um, and so uh, you can issue the command there to coordinate an entire node, or you can isolate a singular pod. To isolate a singular pod with a container or containers, um, you need to develop a default deny policy, and this will be a YAML file, and you'll see you have to apply that uh, specifically to the pod uh, via some version of that command there that will depend, again, on what namespace or workloads you're running. Um, but you can actually quickly Google this, and there, if you say default deny policy for like EKS incident response, um, a few people have a default deny policy, which is really convenient. You can copy paste probably most of that and be able to do that. Um, but know that at a, at a pod level, uh, it's more than just one command, right? It's, you have to develop a YAML file to, to, to develop that policy for network uh, containment. And so we also wanna contain the instance, right? So we're dealing in kind of the Kubernetes EKS space and we're dealing with like, this is all on an instance in AWS thing, right? And so our standard instance containment techniques are going to apply to this here. And so this is kind of where I'll refer you back to my EC2 incident response and forensics presentation, where I walk in painstaking detail through mechanisms for a containment or attempted containment in certain areas. Uh, and you'll understand why I say that when you, when you watch the presentation, um, because how you contain it depends on your goals and also which mechanisms you use. And security groups can't necessarily contain an instance. That's an entire another hour or two topic that I can't get into at this moment, um, but there are mechanisms to do that, but understand what those are, right? So we're going to contain it. We're going to remove or update the instance profile uh, to make sure that the, the continued accesses aren't there or privileges aren't there. And important, right? So you can remove a profile. You can change a profile on an instance, but there's still maybe temporary credentials that are active even if you completely remove a profile and you say there's no longer any privileges or role associated with it, well, there might be temporary accesses that are still available from an attacker, which by the way, they can use to then continue to update the existing temporary credentials indefinitely. And this can go on for a long, long time and you think it's contained and it's not, right? So make sure you do that. So now we've collected the stuff. How do we analyze this stuff? So we'll start with disk. So Docker Forensics Toolkit, I happen to pick this utility. It's relatively useful. Um, and so I'm just using it as an example. It's not something you have to use. I found it made my life a little bit easier. Um, you could probably develop your own tool like this. If you look at the source code of it, what it does is it knows exactly where these containers reside on disk. It uses logic knowing the, the base image paths and stuff like that, like we went through in one of my first slides and said, where, the, where does the data reside? And it programmatically goes through it and says, you know, list pods, list containers, stuff like that. So very, very useful. It extracts it, abstracts it to a higher level and does make your life a lot easier. Um, but that's what this toolkit is using. I happen to pick it. And that's kind of what we're going to use for, for disk analysis here, right? So the way we go about it is, you know, pretty standard for an inst instance compromise, right? So we've collected, we've snapshotted volumes, right? So we need to create a forensic analysis instance to stand it up to analyze this disk, create new volumes from the ones uh, that were previously acquired, attach them mount them read only. It's very, very important to mount them read only. Do we want to mount them with write privileges? No, we want to mount them read only. How do we want to mount them read only? Like seriously double, triple down on this because it is something you can easily overlook, right? And you want to, you want to be messing up your, your artifacts, right? Fortunately, we have snapshots of it. We can create another one from it. It's not the point. Get used to mounting stuff read only, right? Make a, uh, prevent us from making accidental changes, right? And then we instrument the Docker Forensics Toolkit and bam, we get to work. So get Docker environment information. This is really cool. So you do DOS, Docker Forensics Toolkit. Now I'm thinking about, it. I don't know why it's DOF. Why isn't it DFT? I don't know. Anyway, they named it that, not my tool. Um, so we do DOF status. We get a bunch of information about the Docker Forensics environment. 
let's list all the containers running on the system, right? So it programmatically goes through it and lists all the containers running. It lists all the images, right? So if you're running a container, it pulled an image either that you created or from some repository, that's going to give you a bunch of information about that. Um, and a little note here, so images that, so it'll, it'll list a bunch of images and it'll show the repository it's pulled from. But if it doesn't, if it doesn't show it belongs to a repository, then they were likely built on the local system. So it's kind of a nice little thing to know or an artifact to know when you're you're uh, listing images for a system, right? So if you're using only known things from Red Hat or wherever, and you see this image was launched, but it wasn't from a repo and it was locally built, it might be something to look into, right? So let's let's identify specific containers or pod information, right? So we know the specific pod. We have a guard duty alert. Here's the pod name. Let's look only at that pod. Right. Let's show the image build history. This is really, really useful too. So if an attacker built an image, right? So we know from operating in the cloud and stuff like that, like you go to a marketplace, you go wherever, download, like start a start a system, you know, build an instance from this image uh from, from Joe Schmo or whatever, right? Like who knows? Who knows what's in that thing, right? It's like super easy to start up any image that anyone's built anything from, right? And so it's really, really useful to understand the image build history. So it'll show the commands that were actually used to build this image, which is really, really useful. I have seen attackers build images and systems, uh, and they leave the command line history in there. Uh, and it's incredibly useful uh, from a responder perspective. And I would imagine it's not uncommon in EKS either. So definitely leverage this to your advantage. Um, and here you can show all the logs, right? So this is an offline disk image. We collected the disk. All the pod logs are there, right? So we just give it show container log for a container. Boom. All the logs are there, right? Makes your life really, really easy. Now, each of those pods or containers has its own file system, right? So if you're new to containers or you already understand this, like each container has its own kind of instance of a file system that it does irrespective of the actual host itself. So a lot of times it makes sense to go, what was done on that image? So it stood up an Nginx server that was a container that was running its own little web server as a pod or container, but like what was done on that image or, or on that file system, right? This is where it's gonna be very, very useful to mount a container as a file system uh, and do your own forensic analysis like it was any other system. The, direct, the directories would be a little different. There's nuances because it's like its own little file system. Some things are read only. Some it's kind of beyond the scope of this, but this tool helps you mount that, right? Uh, and kind of how you'll know it's mounted is because you say it's mounted overlay on temp or whatever, right? So overlay is that file system type and shows we've successfully mounted that. And now we can use our standard forensic analysis tools like plus the file system, run a timeline, do whatever, right? This is a file system now. You've mounted a file system. Might as well mount a file system from a physical physical system, right? Not necessarily different for analysis purposes, right? Then unmount it and go on your way, right? So this is a mechanism to do that from a disk perspective. So memory analysis. So um, this should help visually kind of depict what I was talking about earlier. And, uh, and this is kind of was an eye-opening thing to me and it made it a, a lot less daunting to me when I was thinking about memory analysis for containers. So, so I talked about it, right? You have these parent processes that are container D shim or container D or Docker or whatever the, the underlying instrumenting system of running containers is, right? And then you have, you know, sub process of these of these little containers, right? So this helps visualize it. There's the uh, volatility command if you're using volatility to, to do memory analysis, right? So we can see here one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, 10, whatever, 10 containers. Interesting thing on EKS, I don't know if this is the same anywhere else, but you have a bunch of these things that are container D shims that just say pause. I don't know if anyone knows the answer to, to why that is. I haven't looked further into that. Um, but that's kind of interesting as, a, as an artifact of this when I was doing the research because I did not personally launch those containers. So it has to be something on the back end doing instrumentation. Anyways, I don't have time to go on that tangent. Why did someone ask me about that? I don't know. Um, so looking at volatility and memory. So, um, what about examining a specific container and pod, right? So we have each of those parent processes, we have parent ID. So we go about doing volatility analysis like we would do any other memory analysis, right? So we're just looking at, at certain process IDs, we're looking at certain parents, we're looking at certain childs. So if there's a parent process of container D shim uh, with a certain thing, we're gonna, we could possibly dump the entire uh, memory space of that uh, and look for specific things uh, in it that are malware. Uh, we can do this by Linux prop maps, we can use it by Linux dump map, um, so again, memory analysis is kind of an entirely separate thing, but this should kind of give you a baseline fundamental understanding of how it works. Volatility is going to be a standard utility you can use just like everything else, right? You're going to be looking at parent and child process relationships. You're going to be looking at what's going on in those processes. You're going to be looking at, you know, what's executable memory. You're going to be looking at, you know, dumping process maps and, and, you know, uh, spaces in memory and looking for executable, like standard memory analysis, right? But this is the methodology to kind of go about doing that. 
Now we're on the log analysis, right? So there's cloud trail, which is the control plane logs, which is like the higher level infrastructure stuff. And then there's the EKS auto logs. So I'm only gonna give you some examples from the cloud trail stuff because I don't wanna spend too much time on it. Um, it will be useful, um, but I happen to choose Athena, which uses SQL to kind of help you get started on how you might going on, how you might go about doing analysis on the cloud trail management logs of clusters and things like that, right? So here's uh, a, a sample command you can run. Uh, and Athena here uses partitioning and things like that uh, to, to look at where the event source is EKS and group them by top actions to see whether top EKS events that's happening in the, the control plane for cloud trail. What about identifying all the create actions, right? Creating things, creating new infrastructure. This would be a great example of things to run, right? Um, and we'd do the same for anything that was deleted, right? So we can identify all delete star EKS events, right? Uh, and so you have optional date partitions. This is kind of how you minimize how things run uh, and discussing how Athena runs is kind of a separate presentation, but uh, I provide this as an example uh, for you all to take and use and kind of get started for, for cloud trail log analysis. So now we get to the audit logs, right? So let's say it's starting with a node. How do we identify all actions associated with a node? And this uses Cloud CloudWatch logs insights, right? So you enable the logs, you can easily send them to CloudWatch and you can use CloudWatch logs insights as a great native utility that's frankly surprisingly powerful because um, I typically use Athena, um, but I found when I was using Cloud CloudWatch logs insights to do this, it gave me everything I needed in a very uh, easy fashion. So I used it for the presentation. So adjust the timestamp filter based on what you need to do, but Remember going back to the example, uh, well, we have a node, but how do we identify the instance ID, right? So we can filter for messages like node name and get the, the private IP uh, or filter on the private IP and uh, identify all the actions associated with a specific node, right? So this node to be compromised, tell me everything that happened there, right? Um, identify all API auto logs with create events for that node, right? So maybe I just want to see what infrastructure has changed or what infrastructure has been created, right? Like things that have been changed or mutated, right? And don't worry about copying all these down. These will be available in the presentation. These are just examples I, I provide so you can have them as a takeaway, uh, but I don't want to harp too much about them right now. Um, what about identify who created a node, right? So I got an alert for this thing. It's possibly a bad node, but who created it? When? And what's the instance metadata along with that to give me more information, right? So again, you know, it's not just like figure out who launched it. Like this is the answer to figure out who launched it. Like this is the how, this is the search, right? So when I say, here's a, here's a node that might be compromised. This is one of the first things I'm gonna run to show me, well, who created that? Who, what's, the, what's the principle associated with this possibly bad activity? Identify when other infrastructure was created or launched. Here we can see if we filter for log streams, right? This is where we're getting into which specific EAKS audit logs are useful, right? Um, so for this particular one, Cloud Controller Manager is gonna, is gonna list when this infrastructure was created, uh, who created it, things like that. Uh, what about all scheduling activity on node? When were things scheduled to run? Uh, who scheduled them to run? This can include things like pod deployments and, and changes and, and work groups and stuff like that. So this is the, the cube scheduler logs, right? So we see we're, we're looking at that EKS audit log. Or I just want all the actions associated with a pod. I have a privilege escalation pod. I have a specific pod that might have something bad, right? Give me everything that relates to uh, the object reference name is pod name. Give me all the actions that are associated with it, right? This gives me an idea of the, the superset of actions that were done against a container and pod. Or who, who created that specific container and pod, right? So we have who created a specific node. We can filter on who created a specific pod, right? They may be the same maybe different, right? This helps us get to what is, what is, this, what is this entity or entities that are, that are actually interacting with this and doing stuff. Identify where the container pod was scheduled or run, right? Um, so if we have a pod that was deployed, we have a privilege, privilege escalation pod, we might have the name of the cluster, but we might not have the name of the node, right? We might not have the name of the instance, right? And this is one way to look at the scheduler. We use AKS audit logs to our advantage and go, well, that has to be scheduled. It has to be scheduled to run somewhere. We know that pod was run somewhere, but where, right? So look through those logs and give me all the messages associated with that specific pod that we're looking into. <clears throat> Identify the instance ID of node, right? This is another way to do this through log analysis, right? So we did it through kubectl, active investigation, right? We're interrogating this sort of stuff, right? But remember that like live action interrogation uh, is different, right? It might modify stuff, right? So that we can do this through logs. Uh, identify commands executed against or on the pod through kubectl. So attackers can also use this to, to run things on a pod, right? This is very, very useful information and material. And 
again, it's a lot of material. It's a lot of stuff. I'm kind of kind of burned through it because it's only a 35 minute presentation and I'm right at the end. Um, but there, there's really a lot more to this, right? When, when we look at stuff and we say, how do we do incident response and forensic analysis of this sort of stuff? And right, it's great to say, yeah, uh, figure out who did that, identify the entity that's associated with that, identify what other actions they've done. Like this is the roadmap to do that. Right? This is the roadmap to be able to answer those questions by looking through the logs, collecting disk, how to collect it, what tools and utilities to look at the disk, what tools and utilities to look at the memory, right? So there's a variety of mechanisms to do that. Uh, and kind of the first step and the big step for me was, was getting this out there and saying, this is the contents, this is the file structure, this is what you know is really under the hood, really on a, a disk level. And like, this is what resides where, here's how to access it, right? And here's how to effectively go and issue the, these exact commands to answer those questions where everything kind of left off up until now. Right. So understanding what logs exist, what they contain, how to access them, how to analyze them. Right. That's all all key to doing this. Hopefully this helps provide a better roadmap to do that. Um, and that is the end of my presentation now. And I think I have like three minutes left for questions if anybody has them. Yes. If, if you're trying to automate the the individual instance logs to go into something like CloudTrail, is that possible? Want to? Yeah, so yeah. So uh, this is really hard to present in 35 minutes. I tried to hit all the high points. This is one that's another high point that I would hit if I had five more minutes. Um, yes, you can automatically export logs in real time, which might be a great idea right at a pod level, right? So you might use FluentBit or so, something. There's plenty of even native system utilities, right? To actively exploit or export system logs or whatever. And that could be a great idea to do. So you don't have to worry about this backend collection, right? And also that gives you real time detection and learning at a pod level, right? Good question. I think there was another one up here. Uh, you, you talked about uh, a number of tools there, which I'm not familiar with. Um, are they pretty portable across clouds? Like if, if it's a Linux system and it's Docker, it'll work in you know, Kubernetes anywhere, or are they fairly AWS specific? Um, the, the tools you're asking about are the tools? Yeah, the, the tools you, you were talking about. Like Docker about. Forensics Toolkit. Um, yeah, so Docker, front, uh, Docker Forensics Toolkit runs on Linux, so it's gonna run on any Linux anywhere, right? Where, you're, where you'll have the problem is I did CloudWatch Logs Insights as a mechanism for searching, but the logs exist. Like the format exists, you can look at what it is. Those logs exist elsewhere. So everyone to search them. If you got a sim, you can you want to use. I do Linux command line log analysis, probably the same way as this. I just thought I would do CloudWatch logs insights because it's very useful and service. You can do it right there. There's a variety of ways to do it, right? And so those tools necessarily aren't portable, but I don't think that necessarily matters because the logs are well known. They're structured, right? And I think more important is knowing what they are and what contents are in them, and which you search and how to identify the information you need to really comprehensively investigate. That's the stuff that's in here. And then whatever tool you use to get there, tell it to you, whatever you want. Yeah. Is there any more questions? I can't, the light's kind of in my eyes, so I don't know. Thank you, Jonathan. Okay. Thank you. Good. Thank you, Jonathan, yeah. very much.